Welcome everybody. I'm delighted to welcome, welcome you all to the first of our new book series events. Uh, my name is Steve Brammer. I'm Dean of the School of Management and it's a real pleasure to host uh, so many of you today for this fantastic event. These are events in which we celebrate a new book by one of our amazing current academic staff or emeritus academic staff or one of our fabulous and illustrious uh, alumni. The events are an opportunity to take a deep dive into the story of a book uh, and for our community, our staff, our students and our alumni to hear directly from the author. I'm grateful to colleagues, uh, Katie, Rachel, Joanna and to Alan for their support in making today's event happen. I'm really delighted that we've got this series of events off the ground. I'm also delighted to welcome uh, and to thank uh, the author of the book that we're focusing on today. That's Bob Wigley uh, for sharing the story of his book, Born Digital, The Story of a Distracted Generation, uh, on which more shortly. Briefly on housekeeping before we get stuck into the uh, conversation today. Um, for those that are on social media, we're using the hashtag, hashtag book series. Uh, and please do join us on the School of Management LinkedIn community a link will be posted in the chat. I'd also invite colleagues to post any questions that they might like to pose to Bob um, that emerge or are provoked by the conversation uh, uh, in the chat function. Uh, and the plan is for Bob and I to have a discussion for perhaps 40 minutes or so, uh, and then to open up for Q&A. Um, during that Q&A, we'll try using the uh, raised hands function um, for colleagues to put their questions directly to Bob. If that doesn't work so well, then I'm happy to read the questions out of the, out of the chat myself. Just a reminder that uh, today's event is being recorded so that we can share this after with communities that can't make it. Um, so if you're happy to ask a question on the proviso that you know you're being recorded, then, then we'll be very happy for you to do that. Right then, let's kick off. Uh, Bob will be known to very many of you uh, as one of our most prominent and successful alumni, and it's a real pleasure to welcome Bob today um, to join us for this event. Uh, Bob has a, a storied career in finance, uh, being chair of a number of financial institutions, including Merrill Lynch's Europe, Middle East and African regional operation, uh, as well as being a member of the Bank of England's board during the global financial crisis. So I think it's fair to say he's been at the thick of uh, global finance over the last 25 years or so. I saw him described as a grandee, among other things, in, in things I was reading for, for preparation for this, which, which I think is situate sufficiently the esteem within which you're, you're held in that community, Bob. These days, Bob still re uh, retains a number of non-executive ro uh, roles, including chairmanships, both in the private and voluntary sectors, uh, and is an ardent supporter of young entrepreneurship. Uh, Bob will be known to you as an alum of our business administration undergraduate program, uh, and he was also awarded an honorary doctorate in recognition of his services to society uh, in 2008. So Bob, welcome. Thank you for thank you for joining us for the event. It's a real real pleasure to uh, take the time to chat over your book today. Perhaps before we get into the book, I wonder if you could share some reflections on your time at Bath and where you've gone in your career since. Oh, I had a fabulous time at Bath. I have uh, the fondest memories, uh, not only of uh, great academic learning, but obviously making the friendships that then last you the rest of life and you know, building up a network of, of people who've gone on to do fantastic things in their chosen field. So couldn't speak more highly of my experience of, of, of Bath University and my time there. I'm very, very happy to be supporting you as you move forward uh, and go on to even greater successes. And as, as to since then, well, you you very kindly given me a glowing <laughs> introduction. I hardly recognise myself. but yeah. So I spent 25 years in the banking industry, as you said, rising eventually to running Merrill Lynch's European operations. That meant I had 9,000 people in 23 countries and a balance sheet of about a half a trillion dollars of, of gross assets. Um, two or three interesting things around the time of the financial crisis, the Prime Minister asked me to join the Board of the Bank of England to help them think about how to prepare for the crisis and, and how to deal with it. I also worked quite closely with Boris Johnson when he was Mayor of London, um, uh, just after that, actually leading an exercise to look at why London had been so successful as a global financial centre over many decades and to put in place some ideas for how we could make sure it stayed there and of course given Brexit since then it's become even more relevant that we think those issues through and then the other thing I did which turned out 
to be the beginning of a new kind of whole area of, of, of study was chair of the Green Investment Bank Commission for George Osborne, which led to the setting up of the Green Investment Bank, uh, which was then run successfully and finally privatised. And uh, I think we're talking about having another one. Um, so uh, I was very lucky to do all sorts of interesting things. And then over the last 10 years since I've left banking, I've been more focused on working with young entrepreneurs in cutting edge technology businesses. And I suppose that in a way was the lead up to writing the book. Fantastic. I mean, I'd be very interested to hear more around the motivations and the process for writing the book, because I think I think both are really fascinating, having having read the book and have spoken to you about it offline before. It's unusual to, to hear uh, practitioners engaging in what to me is is kind of grand social theory at one level. This is a very intellectually expansive uh book in lots of different ways. I'd be interested to hear a little bit of the origins and the motivations of the book. Well, I think two, two fundamental uh, origins, and I'll talk a bit about the process. So the first was just watching my own three adolescent children. Uh, they're now 22, 20 and 17, but were two years younger than that when I started the process. Um, growing up, how, watching how they use technology in a very different way from my generation and how I felt that it affected the development of their personalities and their view of the world. And then the other thing was that a couple of years ago, I adopted a New Year's resolution to try and meet a new Generation Z entrepreneur every business day, um, to hear about a business idea from them and talk it through and see how I could help them. And what that did was cement my view that Generation Z does not represent incremental change from my generation, but fundamental change across a whole range of factors, partly facilitated by technology. And I think recognising that, that possibly quite a lot of people my age haven't joined up the dots and realised how massive that change is and that it isn't going to reverse. I wanted to explore that and record uh, what I'd learned. And that was, so that, that was why I wrote the book. In terms of the process, um, I wrote down some chapter headings, which I kind of been noodling on for a while. And then I Googled the chapter headings just to see what was out there. Um, and of course, what you discover then is that someone's written an entire book on each of your chapters. Um, so the next thing you have to do is read that book because you might either be repeating what they've already said uh, or you might be in disagreement with them, in which case you need to understand why they came to their view. So the next thing I did was read 35 books. And then on the back of that and the references in those books, um, probably 200 government reports, um, charity, well-being charity reports, academic papers. And then at that end of that process, um, I felt I was able to actually sit down and start doing some writing, which I did in lockdown one. Yeah, I, I think the process in particular, the process of interviewing uh, a young entrepreneur, a business day, I mean, I, the, 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 that must have been an absolutely fascinating thing to do over the course of a year, 18 months, or however long it took for you, for you to do that. Could you say a little bit about your, your reflections on sort of what you what do you take away from 200 odd conversations with you know a, a generation that is you know if one reads between the lines of your book on the, on the one hand deeply inspiring on the other hand my sense is you sort of go away slightly worried for them in a, in a sense uh, it'd be interesting to hear you reflect a little bit on the conversations with, with those entrepreneurs yeah so picking up on both sides of that i mean the first thing to say was that it was always the best hour of every day um, and indeed, some of them used to say to me, um, why are you having breakfast with me? I, you know, we've looked at your CV. It seems you could be having breakfast with the prime minister, to which I would say, well, that's actually very easy. And current company accept, ex accepted, Steve, I hasten to add, most people my age, I think are pretty dull. You know, at that stage, pre-COVID, all they wanted to talk about was Brexit. The fact that they didn't enjoy the, their job, didn't earn enough money or had marital issues. Whereas when you meet uh, you know, a 20-year-old um, who's got a great business idea and is full of enthusiasm, excitement, passion, you, know, you take away a lot of energy from those, those conversations. So it was always the best hour of every day. Um, and what I came away with was, was a clear understanding that um, if I was an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old today, I think I'd be pretty cross with our generation. If you think of the hand of cards that we're leaving behind us, whether it be the continuing global war on terror, a damaged planet, most recently um, COVID debt, um, you know, there are a whole range of things that we're leaving this generation, which I'm not sure we should, you know, they should be thanking us for, frankly. Uh, but what it has led to is a set of values that they have, which really question 
um, today's uh, model of capitalism and whether, whether businesses can simply be businesses or whether they don't need to be purposes. And as you know, Steve, as you read the book, one of my chapters is called Purposes, Not Businesses. And I realized um, 10 minutes into, into probably half my conversations with these entrepreneurs that the organizations they wanted to set up were not businesses as I understood them. They were actually social enterprises. And it comes from a, a fundamental um, expectation in Generation Z that business as it goes forward um, must solve societal issues, not just make profits. Uh, it must serve a much wider range of stakeholders. And I found that profoundly uh, interesting and, uh, and, and profoundly positive. Yeah, no, I, I, I share that positivity. Let's reflect, step back slightly, reflect on the core. There's a core thesis of the book in one sense, and that's that uh, Generation Z as digital natives uh, embark on a life, live in a context and engage with information and technology in ways that in various senses means they're distracted. Could you say a little bit about the nature of that distraction, the origins of that distraction, substantiate where that idea, that core idea of this distracted generation came from? Yeah, so so the book is basically about the fact that I think um, society's collective attention has been, as I call it, neurologically hijacked by a tsunami of, of tech devices and apps that dominate um, our collective attention, not just Generation Z, it's actually all of our attention if we're truthful about it, um, and, and do so in the pursuit of the profit and loss accounts of a relatively small number of very large tech businesses, who it seemed to me, at least, have too little regard to the uh, welfare of their customers. Uh, and, and in my view, need to find a better balance between profit and, and societal purpose and well-being. Um, and of course, there have been massive benefits from this technology, so I'm not anti-technology in any sense. You know, they have transformed um, the ease with which we gather information, uh, the way we educate ourselves, just look back at the way you've been teaching during COVID, the way we shop, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we get jobs, the way we politic, the way we observe our religions and the way that we start, build and run businesses. But in the same decade that these technologies have become ubiquitous in our lives, so adolescent well-being has declined. And in fact, unhappiness, loneliness, sleep deficit, anxiety, depression, and sadly even self-harm and suicide, collectively what I'll call for the rest of this conversation, the negative factors, you know, have all risen for the Gen Z cohort very substantially. And um, whilst I'm not suggesting that technology is the sole cause, and indeed, uh, as no doubt we'll come on to discuss, nor does the academic evidence suggest that there's a proven causal link between screen time, social media use in general, and these negative factors, I don't believe it's a coincidence. Um, so what do we mean by this distraction? Well, it's the inability to uh, focus on anything for any period of time because your multiple devices are constantly dragging you away uh, to get your attention onto what the big techs want you to pay attention to. Uh, you know, uh, and that's led to a whole range of behaviours, but, you know, which which I call I call it in the book, um, uh, it's obviously serial multitasking, but I call, I call generations that in the book digital bees because they like to... Um, snack on multiple information pots they don't actually do anything for very long and even when they are doing something they're probably not doing it in a focused way they're they're doing it in parallel with two or three other things at the same time so that's the point really yeah and, and I, I you know as as those who who will read the book will will discover for themselves the, the book really explores the profound implications of that hypothesis for many, many spheres of love and life and, uh, you know, relationships and health and uh, perspectives on work and organizing and all sorts of other things, democracy. What's, what's your sense of the two or three arenas that are most profoundly affected and that you are most profoundly concerned about the impacts of distraction on? So um, I guess it's the way that children uh, bond with their parents, bond with each other and develop their personalities. Um, we know that um, children are getting uh, devices younger and younger and spending more and more time on them. As one academic said recently, preschool children have taken to tablets like ducks to water, which is a very good way of putting it, I think. Um, I mean, you'll know because you've read the book, but others won't. So there's some fairly shocking statistics. 30% of babies under one 
watch 90 minutes of screen a day. Um, 64% of one to two year olds uh, watch uh, more than 24 hours, sorry, watch more than uh, 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 two hours of uh, screen time a day. 42% of under eight year olds have their own tablet. I could go on. So, so um, why is that a problem? Well, in the old days, if you were, um, if you were looking at your baby in a pram and you weren't on your mobile phone and they weren't staring at a tablet, you were very directly bonding. You probably picked them up too in a way that now you might not. Um, so what, what children are doing these days is they're cyber socializing. They're, they're growing up in a world which is very much dominated by this technology. And I think that interrupts their ability to bond with their parents, which is an absolutely fundamental part of personality formation. And I think that, um, that unintentionally, but systematically, tech actually interrupts empathy development in just about every one of its natural homes. So whether that be later on kids talking to each other, whether it be kids talking to their parents later in life, whether it's um, kids' relationship with their educators, whether it's at the meal table, uh, and of course we could separately talk about the decline of communal eating itself, whether it's in the way that they observe religion or politics, every single place where empathy would in our generation have developed is pretty much attacked by technology. Not deliberately, it's just an outcome of the way the technology works. And that, that I found profoundly concerning. Yeah, I, I mean, and you do get a very strong sense, as you say, that the, the book the book has so many examples of contexts and extents to which to which this transformation is happening, and it, it is a it is a hugely impressive bit of scholarship in lots of ways. What, one of your one of your takeaways from that, Bob, is that fundamentally um, we need regulation in this space and. As, as a free marketeer and a banker and a, someone who, who's been right at the front of the conversation around you know, the power of global finance and, and free markets in finance for good in the world, um, there's a slightly uneasy sort of relationship between, between uh, um, you know, a history of free marketeering and, and now, now calling for regulation in the tech space. Can you say something a bit about um, where the call for regulation comes from and, and, and what forms of regulation might be particularly useful to to help better outcomes come from the technology. Yeah, some, some of the media observers have, uh, have had quite a bit of fun with that one. Um, so you say, so, you know, slightly odd position for you to take given your f philosophy. Well, I think there are actually some, some parallels with, uh, with my experience of financial services and the financial crisis. So if you think about what happened in the financial services sector over sort of 40, 50 years, you had incremental uh, innovation every day. And, and what happened is that um, regulation didn't keep up with that change in the aggregate because it was slow and gradual. And if you think about what's happened in tech over 10 years, you know, these, these companies have become ubiquitous in every aspect of our lives. It hasn't happened though overnight. It's happened day by day over 10 years. And I would argue we're in exactly the same situation. Regulation hasn't kept up and it now needs to catch up uh, rapidly. Um, what kind of regulation are we talking about? Well, I think we could pay great credit, actually. Um, I know it's not, not always, um, not always uh, popular to do so, but I actually think our own government is taking some pretty, pretty bold initiatives in this space, actually world leading legislation that they're introducing this year. Um, think about it like um, health and safety legislation, the industrial, resolution, uh, industrial revolution. You know, we had um, we suddenly had after the Industrial Revolution, big factories with lots of workers using what turned out to be quite dangerous machinery and people would, you know, lose their fingers or fall through windows or damage themselves in very various ways. And a lot later, governments decided it was time to legislate to give employers a responsibility to protect their employees in the workplace, so-called health and safety legislation. So the government is introducing this year something called the Online Harms Bill. Well, I think it's now been renamed the Online Safety Bill. Um, which essentially um, gives the big techs, um, for the first time ever, a statutory duty of care to consider what damage their software pl uh, platforms and services might, um, might uh, do to their customers. And if there are harms or damage, they have to consider what actions they should take to mitigate those harms. And every year, Ofcom will have the job of assessing uh, whether these companies have taken sufficient action to mitigate the harms. And if not, they will be able to fine these companies very substantially. So I regard this as, if you like, overdue catch-up uh, and imposing a very sensible responsibility on the big techs to, to think carefully about what they might be doing to society 
and to take action to mitigate harms. And that, by the way, is part of a suite of legislation. There are three other things, very briefly. Um, for the first time in the national curriculum, there will be something called relationship education, which will have in it a module which will teach kids at school the difference between an online and an offline relationship, why there might be particular dangers around online relationships. There's something called the Age Assurance Code, which requires software designers to have regard to what, what content their users might have on different platforms and then think about whether that, uh, that content is user, user age appropriate. And then finally, thinking in terms of um, uh, um, antitrust regulation, uh, within the competition, Competitions and Markets Authority, there's going to be, for the first time, a digital markets unit where specialists will have the job of assessing the rather you know, unique position which these big tech platforms have got themselves into as a series of, in effect, monopsonies and how they now need to be regulated in that environment. So, so I think uh, you know, eight out of ten to the, to the UK government, frankly, ahead of a lot of other countries in the world, for actually trying to have a go at this very complicated problem. It is, as you say, a very, very complicated problem. Um, what what can be done beyond regulation? Is there a role for uh, individual action, corporate action? What, what other ways are the complementary ways of addressing the sorts of challenges that you foresee coming from these technologies? So in the, at the end of the book, I work through all of those things and starting with the question of self-regulation. Um, but as one brilliant academic uh, recently put it, if, you know, if on one side of the screen you have a partially developed adolescent brain and on the other side of the screen, and by the way, you know, one of the things we know about adolescent brains, and particularly boys' brains actually, is that uh, their ability to assess risk it, you know, develops quite late why we all do fairly dumb things sometimes when we're when, you know we're, when we're adolescents um and um uh, and really actually isn't developed until probably someone 23 in the full sense so so there are you know there are sort of sensible reasons why you need to take um action to protect against it but as i said if there's on one side a partially developed adolescent brain and on the other side of the screen 100 of the world's best neuroscientists um, are working hard to addict you. I mean, that isn't really a fair fight, it seems to me. So we can educate people to self-regulate, but I don't think we should overestimate our ability to self-regulate as, as teenagers. Um, then I think there is a role for um, education, educators to help children and parents, of course, to help children understand the risks of being online. And actually the biggest one of those is about engagement with your children about their online life. So, you know, I don't know about you, when I talk to my children I, and I ask them what they were doing, it tends to focus on the fact that they went to the park to play football or met John to play tennis or went for a drink or whatever. We don't tend to say, okay, fascinating, but between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m., when you spent four hours on Snapchat and Instagram, as a matter of interest, you know, without prying, Kind of who were you talking to and what sort of issues were you talking about and how did you feel at the end of it we don't we don't have that conversation and maybe we should because that actually is where the youngsters are are leading a big chunk of their lives and if we're not engaging ourselves in it and understanding it then we can't really help them nav navigate it seems to me mm. then there are things then there are things just to, find, to sort of finish your question that the big techs could do themselves around better product design to be more safe uh, to think more about how users could be protected um, and of course there's the governance of the big techs themselves I and mean, one of the one of the fascinating things i point out in the book is google which has an average staff age of 29 has an average board age of 62 the youngest person on its board is 47 every single member of its board is worth if not hundreds of millions many millions um, there is one academic who's a lady microbiologist. Um, this does not look to me, I have to say, like a board that's looking for any kind of challenge in terms of its business model. You know, where is the ex-media regulator? Where is the child development psychologist? Where is the adolescent well-being uh, charity specialist? I mean, so I think there's lots we could expect the companies to do. And maybe they will over time. But ultimately, the reluctant conclusion is none of that's going to work which is why I end up with um, uh, uh, applauding the UK government's move to regulation and, and asking other governments to follow suit. Are there, are there other countries that are doing this particularly well or particularly badly, Bob? So Australia, I think, has um, created the role of e-commissioner, e-safety commissioner, as somebody who works for the government, and their job is to advise the public on how to use the internet safely. Um, they have a website and staff and training, 
and they also advise the government on steps it should take to protect the public from uh, dangerous aspects of the internet. So I think Australia is to be applauded. And of course, you saw them recently take on Facebook in the context of news feeds. I think the EU is developing, developing some very interesting ideas around data sharing. So they're saying, okay, you've now built these monopsonies, which have given you massive control of huge swathes of data. And we're going to force you to make that data available to medium and smaller size companies who don't have your market power. So that's something that our own digital markets unit, you know, could look at now, now that we, we've left the EU, obviously. And then in America, which is really where you should expect this to start, but of course, under the previous government, it was never going to. Um, we'll see what Biden does. I mean, the big proposal there is the consideration of um, repealing Section 230, which is a piece of legislation which exempts big tech platforms from having to take responsibility for user generated content. In other words, allowing them to use the cover of being a platform, not a publisher. And of course, if that were repealed or used in scope um, substantially, that would strike at the heart of their business models and, and the whole issue of content moderation would then very much come to the fore. Perhaps let's dive, dive into a couple of specific areas, uh, both of which you've sort of alluded to. I, I'd be very interested to hear your analysis of the implications for democracy right there are various domains where the distracted generation as it manifests has some really quite profound implications not only for them in terms of their well-being we've touched upon that but in a sense for the for the functioning of a healthy society uh, and one of those is politics and policy and democracy i wonder whether you could say a little bit about um following following your analysis through what the worries are for democratic society of the kinds of trends that you talk about in the book. Yeah, so that's, that, that's a really interesting area. So I think um, the cynics say that um, we, we're in an age of clicktivism or even slacktivism, meaning whereas you and I might have marched on uh, Greenham Common or as indeed I have myself marched past the end of 10 Downing Street to, to, uh, to make a point about something, uh, youngsters now simply sign a petition online or like a campaign and regard the job as done. It's sort of, it's, I think it's unfairly uh, labelled slacktivism along the lines of kind of armchair politics. I think it's unfair because actually, if you think about some of the major global um, campaigns, uh, think about Greta Thunberg, for example, um, you know, or, or Black Lives Matter or any of the um, campaigns in the US against um, guns in schools, for example, guns around schools and gun licensing laws. Many of them, are, if not started by youngsters, have been massively amplified by youngsters and, and promulgated through social media. So I do think that um, technology is fundamentally changing the way that politics um, is undertaken and in many ways is undermining the traditional authority of some of our political institutions, and perhaps in a good way, because it's empowering more people to participate in the political process. Where it's dangerous um, is that it enables state uh, intervention in other people's politics. Uh, we've seen, you know, we, we know this happens, there's absolutely no question it happens. Plenty of evidence around, you know, campaigns on Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere used by governments against other governments to, to meddle in their political processes. Um, and I think one of the big issues that has to be addressed at some point um, uh, alongside fake news is that of really fake identity. So um, we don't require people to identify themselves on the web um, when they sign up to a platform. If we did, it would massively reduce their ability to enter into the worst, what I call the worst kinds of behaviour. So I would include in that spreading fake news, cyberbullying and technology assisted child sexual abuse. If we required people to, you know, if we got rid of fakes, just to give you some idea, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish, um, in the first quarter of last year, and these are Facebook's own statistics, they removed 2.2 billion fake accounts. They've now started trying to take down fake accounts, which they didn't before. Um, that's, that was broadly equivalent to their total number of active users at the end of the second quarter. So in three months, they themselves produced 100% churn in their user base, if you think about it. That is a phenomenal statistic. Um, and that is why I'm afraid we should be worried about what um, some of this technology is doing in terms of spreading, spreading fake news uh, and worse. Yeah, the whole digital identification, non-anonymous, 
non anonymity thing, I think is, as you say, incredibly profound. The, the other area I was very struck by in, in the book is is the implications for work organizations, attitudes towards careers, how how Generation C, uh, Z thinks about um, the sorts of work that it's interested in and, and its lens on careers in a sense. And one of the things I've noticed that's that's profound in my time as you know in business education is when we started off, everyone wanted to go into a corporate. And um, and really over the last 20 years or so, that has changed hugely. And many, many, many more students now have an aspiration to establish their own businesses and so on and so forth. Could you reflect a little on on what you what the the takeaways from your analysis are for um, how gener how Generation Z thinks about work, what the aspirations are, what the implications are perhaps for established kinds of organisations who might want to attract um, talent in this generation? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think when I started work, and indeed it's what I did, I wanted to work for a big, famous, stable, profitable company. Um, if you ask Generation Z what they want to do, 75% of them say... Uh, they want to work for what I call a purpose, not a business. In other words, an organisation that has some impact on society and that, and that, that, that it solves a societal um, problem. And so I do think we're now in the purpose-driven era as far as Generation Z is concerned. So um, if you are a corporate and you, don't, you haven't enunciated a purpose that goes beyond simply um, serving your shareholders... As far as Generation Z is concerned, you probably don't have a future. And given it's their, you know, they now represent a third of the uh, population. It's their digital wallet that will be driving your revenue in the future. That's something that business really needs to be focused on. And of course, you know, big businesses by and large are. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is in terms of the type of work um, that Generation Z wants. Again, we wanted to go somewhere, stay there for five to ten years, work our way through a sort of structure, get promoted, get higher salaries. I think um, uh, that Generation Z doesn't look at it that way at all. I think they're looking at um, what I call experiences, not jobs. So it'd be much shorter term roles, um, project based work, something that's customized to them, that has training in. You should expect them to job hop, to do what I call take, learn, and move. Um, Reid Hoffman at LinkedIn said that he, you know, he regards people coming to LinkedIn as a tour of duty, it's rotational. It's to learn, it's potentially translational to, to someone's long-term career, but it's short-term. Um, they're also, I think, interested not really in, in, in salary progression, but what I call benefits, not salaries. That means, you know, much more flexible holiday arrangements, flexi time, being able to work from home. I'll come back to the concept of digital workplaces in a minute. A cool environment in a cool location, um, paid time off, the ability to access your salary at any time during the month, not just at the end of the month. So, it is a fundamentally different way of looking at work from the way uh, we looked at it. And just on digital workplaces, um, this is not a, a term I coined, but it, it does neatly summarise the way Gen Z looks at it, which is, you know, it's not a physical place. It, you know, you work wherever you are. Um, if you do go into the workplace, you're certainly going to assess your employer by their degree of technological sophistication. You know, do they make it easy for you to work either in the office or anywhere else? Are they digitally sophisticated in the way they communicate with you? So think about your application process. We now have what we call SNAP applications. In other words, rather than you filling in boring forms online and going through the traditional sort of CV submitting process and long interviews, you know, short, snappy, video-based processes are the way forward. And that will feed its way through to the way staff surveys are undertaken, the way staff are communicated with through short videos from their bosses, you know, rather than long, boring emails. Yeah, we need to we need to appeal to the sort of TikTok, if you like, mentality of communication, short, snappy, high in information content, appealing, entertaining. This is an entertainment quotient in all of this. So I'll stop there. But I mean, it's so fundamentally different. Uh, you know, one can it's almost difficult to know where to start. Mm. I think uh, I mean, it certainly as 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 a sort of leader manager in an organization of rather traditional sort it, I am I'm vaguely quaking in my boots at the idea I've got to be uh, entertaining and TikTokish, ish but you know in, in for a penny in for a pound I say um, I, I was also interested in in your reflections and they're relatively brief in the book so so it's it might be useful to expand on, on them a little bit 
there's a lot in the ether at the moment po uh, about post-COVID. Are we all going back to the workplace in the same way as we were before? Or will the wishes, in a way, very resonant with Generation Z that you that you talk about, um, and perhaps applying across generations for more flexible modes of work and so on and so forth, will they prevail? And it's interesting that you get some really leader leading bankers, you know, at Goldman's and other places, saying we want them back in the workplace, and then actually quite a lot of employee voice saying actually we like we like the way this is now we might come in for a day or two a week but but, but actually we like that as this is a more ongoing um a more ongoing phenomenon what's your sense of how that will play out there seem to be some quite different voices in society there and and, and some sort of opposite oppositional tension where do you think the cards will fall there well so i think one of the things that covid did um is made us all realize that the way Generation Z looks at the workplace um, is in a way the right way. In other words, it isn't the place. It's just, where, you know, it's just wherever you do your work. And that might be in an office. It might be on transport between somewhere and somewhere else. It might be at home. Um, that's, what, that's, what I, that's what I mean by digital workplaces. It's a sort of, a, you know, in the same way that Generation Z doesn't see a difference between the online and the offline world it's just the world right whereas for us who grew up before online we see a distinction so they don't they just don't they don't see being at work as being in an office being at work is the act of working wherever that is and i think what covid did was made us all realize that actually that can work for a lot of us and in fact can work for many of us very nicely because we don't spend three hours commuting uh, with all the pain and cost that goes with that for employers i think the what I'm seeing, the sophisticated ones do, is actually stratify their jobs within the company into those very few that absolutely have to be done on site. So, I mean, obviously, the security guy has to be on the premise because he's actually yeah. doing the security, right? Uh, the guy who's looking after the server farm in the basement, you know, probably has to be on site um, most of the time. Um, but there are many, many jobs which either can be done part time uh, out of the office or indeed most of the time out of the office. So what most employer, employers are doing, I think, is stratifying, stratifying their jobs into those three categories and then saying to employees, well, within that, it's your choice. You know, if unless you're in category one, in the other two categories, we can certainly allow you to be at home or you know, work from outside the office for big periods of time. And that, uh, I, I think, is the way things will develop. That, that of the two big challenges... I think, are culture creation and innovation. So if you've never been into an office in a company, um, which is sort of where the culture exists in a physical sense, and it's instilled in you, um, how do you do that in an online world? It's not, not impossible, but it will require new ways of thinking. And then there's the whole ideation. You know, how do you get employees sparking off each other uh, without physically being proximate? Again, absolutely doable, through probably through using VR and AR tools, yeah, they're now they're already developing, but I mean, again, it, it requires um, you know uh, clever thinking to recreate the impact, the um, the atmosphere in an office in an online environment. So, uh, last one from me before uh, before we warm up our, our audience. You know, we uh, we in universities are right in the thick of this. Right, we we are we are we care for the born digitals while they're in our halls or around our around our halls and we are preparing the born digital for uh, a safe and productive and healthy life as citizens and, and employees what advice would you give to us in uh, the HE sector about the things that we need to think about and what more could we do to try and tip the balance of the, the the engagement with technology among the born digitals for the positives that come from the technologies rather than the individual and collective risks and challenges that might come well, I, I guess you're doing you're doing some of it immediately by by very rapidly developing your ability to teach online rather than teach you know in a physical setting um, but I guess that has to be taken to the next level. I mean, simply doing Zoom webinars, um, yeah, it's sort of okay as far as it goes, but it doesn't replicate the experience of being in a room and sparking off people, does it? It goes, in a way, it goes to these same points about uh, culture and innovation. You don't get those two things as easily in the online setting. So I think, but, you know, good news is you are the smartest people in the country. So, you know, you will be able to work it out. And my guess is you'll never go back to 100% uh, lecturing in person either. 
right? You, you've you realized actually that there are conveniences and efficiencies, particularly with you know perhaps some overseas students um, or students who are physically remote from the from the from the university for whatever reason. So my guess is there'll be a balance going forward, and you will need to focus on on developing it to the next level. And again, it's about ideation. It's about ways of working. To, you know, how how will students collaborate online? If they're not physically together on projects, all those kind of things, where you know tools will very quickly be developed by the smartest um, to facilitate those things. But that's where I think I'd be focusing. I appreciate that. I think it's a very kind of you to characterise us as uh, you know we've got the tools to work it out. That's that's very kind of you. I might now uh, open it up to colleagues, and I've got some uh, interesting questions begin to show themselves in the. Um, uh, in the Q&A. What can we learn from older technologies and how concerns around their adoption have been dealt with? For example, television or even cinema before that. Some of the concerns regarding screen time distraction, reduced social relations, etc. Um, uh, predate the internet. What, what's your sense of, you know, is this the same old, same old, or is there something profoundly different around the technologies and their effects these days? Yeah, the short answer is yes, profoundly different. So, it, so we are having a rerun of, of the TV debate, right? So as TV became very popular, parents and others started raising questions about whether their children weren't going to become couch potatoes and not do any physical exercise and get hooked on watching, you know, um, uh, TV. Uh, and indeed they did. Um, but if you think about what happened next was we then developed regulation to avoid that becoming... Uh, too much of a problem so we introduced the watershed to deal with the issue of inappropriate comment before content before nine in the evening and we introduced controls around advertising um we have done neither of those things for the internet there is no control of content um pretty much very little control of content i should say um and there is no control of advertising we think that the amount of advertising on the, on the internet given you know given a similar amount of time relative to, to television is between 20 and 40 times as much advertising. Um, we know, um, sadly, because of some lawsuits that have taken place that um, children under 13 have been profiled by some big tech platforms and micro-targeted with advertising. So, so yes, we are having a rerun of the arguments around TV, um, but we should remember what happened next, which was people woke up to what, what the dangers of TV and did something about it. We need to do the same in relation to these new technologies and regulate for their for the dangers that they uniquely present. A really interesting question from Edward, um, uh, which is really about picking away the substance of generational definitions in a sense. And Edward's question is: Have you found these generational differences to be as substantial internationally? So what is is this a globally yeah. applicable story or just something that's happening in in a few of our a few of our developed western societies well the first thing to say is obviously the book can only be based on the evidence that i could read and unsurprisingly most of the evidence comes from the us the uk you know australia and a few and somewhat central europe right um that said um it is absolutely a global issue it plays out differently in different places um relative to local culture Interestingly, some of the worst internet excesses that have led, led to the worst um, effects on adolescents have been in the Far East, where gaming in particular is, um, is a massive problem. And so in China, the head of um, adolescent health at their equivalent of the NHS says that you know, gaming addiction is their number one, uh, health, is the number one health problem for children in China. Um, uh, they have set up uh, digital addiction clinics in China, as indeed they have in South Korea uh, and in um, Japan. And if you look at Japan, there are particular issues around um, the inability of youngsters to form relationships with human beings. There are state-sponsored classes for um, teenagers and young 20-somethings to go and literally learn how to meet a human being. Um, I think it's 30% of men under 30 in Japan are virgins. Um, there are some fairly staggering statistics. And if you want to see how this could develop if we don't do something about it, um, and by the way, I love Japan. This is no criticism of Japan. It's just, these are just facts that, you know, you read, um, you can go and read, uh, you know, just look at some of these Far Eastern economies and, and how they have acted very decisively and, and quite brutally in some places. So, so for example, I, I think it's South Korea, 
has literally banned um, gaming between midnight and 6 a.m. If um, the, the, the internet is in effect turned off to gaming in the night and adults can be prosecuted if their children are found bypassing the system. So, um, yeah, other, other, it is a global story. It plays out differently um, relative to local culture, um, but the issues are definitely not simply ones of the West. Uh, Ayman asks a question, in your opinion, what are the educational implications of technology in the near future and what should we act upon or avoid? Uh, right, so there's a big one, uh, which is the following. Um, in a world dominated by AI, where basic jobs may disappear and the, the only jobs left for human beings will be the complex ones, are we just at the moment when we need to teach our children to focus and concentrate in fact, teaching them uh, to do the opposite. <laughs> in other words, to uh, to serially multitask and never be able to focus and concentrate on one thing. That I think is the central question for educators. Um, you know, if you look at the academic evidence, um, multitasking is a myth. Uh, sorry, efficient multitasking is a myth. People simply aren't efficient when they multitask. They they do less well at each task um, because when they go back to the second or third task, they have to re-educate themselves in where they got to essentially reread in um, it's just you know that's just the way it works the brain is not actually designed to do four things at once well um, so as I said in an AI dominated world maybe we're developing the wrong skill sets um, so I, I, that, that's I think the central question for educators mm. yeah and, and certainly that's something we're giving consideration to in universities how, how do we prepare students to have the higher value skills in, in greater abundance and, and interesting a lot of those are are soft skills actually to to, to your point around uh, empathy rela yeah, yeah. relationships julia i mean really riffing on that um a little asked a question really about those uh, those human qualities as digital experience influences the youngest population's way of relating to parents and friends, are there further implications on development of emotional intelligence qualities? What about compassion or empathy? Have you encountered these topics in your research as well? Yeah, so you'll know, again, because you read the book, I mean, the, the issue of empathy development, it runs right through the book from start to finish. And I, one of my biggest concerns is that technology, as I said, systematically attacks the, place that, the places that empathy would have developed in our generation. Um, and maybe that explains why we have a more polarized society than we've had in recent history. So I think the um, implications um, for uh, empathetic development, what that means for society is huge. And uh, we, we should very much be, be as someone, um, I think James Williams at Oxford um, put it, paying more attention to what we pay attention to because it affects who we are, how we love, how we feel, and we're not sufficiently focused on that. We're allowing our attention to be led um, by the profit motives of a small number of, of large companies. So I'm waiting for a few more questions to come through. I, I'll, I'll, I will riff off a couple of my colleagues while uh, um, oh, I've just got one come through from Veniak. Expanding on international differences, do you think that less developed countries that are still to adapt to the level of adaptation of technology will follow the same trajectory um, in terms of isolation, social behaviour changes? So is this something we're really going to see explode in the Indias, Pakistans, Indonesias, Bangladeshs of the world? Okay, so, so this is a really good point um, uh, and one we haven't touched on at all yet, which is the technology uh, is, is, is dangerous to a lot of people who use it too much, um, but it's equally um, a disadvantage for many people not to have it. And of course, it locks people into poverty. It, it uh, affects their education and life chances. And so when you look at the work the UN is doing around technology, uh, it sort of comes from both ends of the, of the telescope, if you like. At one end, it's looking at what are the dangers to you know more developed societies in terms of overexposure to technology and inappropriate content and online harms and then in africa and elsewhere it's, it's saying okay well how do we make sure that there is a universal access and this is one of tim berners lee's great great kind of uh, mantras how, how can we make sure that you know everyone has access to a laptop everyone has has access to free wi-fi because if they don't, uh, you know, and, and there's, there's some pretty good stuff produced by The Guardian during COVID showing that, you know, working class people in the UK suffered during COVID more than anybody else because they didn't have um, free free data 
and or a laptop uh, and the government as you know took some action to try and do something about that uh, but uh, so it's a really good question uh, and you're absolutely you're absolutely spot on there are different issues for people in different parts of the social spectrum I guess another way of asking that question because I, I agree entirely there's a sort of sweet spot here isn't there you know to, to, too much tech, too abundant, too in, too too available. Problem, not available enough. Problem. There's a sort of Goldilocks bit in the middle. I guess there's another question, maybe wrapped up with uh, Vineyards, which is: Is there a way almost to avoid this by learning the lessons of what has been learned in 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 Western countries as they've as they've encountered this problem? Or is it a sort of necessary developmental stage? Do you have to have gone too far in order to come back? Or can you can you leap straight to the appropriately regulated middle, I guess? Yeah, so I, I think I think the UN is very much trying to do that. I think they're trying to take um, the lessons learned in the most developed economies, developed in inverted commas economies, um, and help uh, still developing countries to avoid some of the obvious pitfalls. Uh, that that involves, um, you know, apart from sort of dissemination of information and best practice, it involves um, a combination of national legislation building on the best in the world. It also involves better internet governance glo globally. There are things that those who in who govern the internet um, can do to improve the situation, and, and there the UN is taking a lead with its internet governance forum to try and um, to try and achieve the objectives I just outlined. So you have to come at it from both ends yeah. on the ground, on the ground up local legislation and then international uh, global globally coordinated better internet governance, hugely complicated by the way, mm. because of course no one owns the internet. It's a bit like the oceans, right? Uh, a bit like the oceans of the world. They're not owned by anybody. So governing them is quite complicated, but the UN have found a way of doing it. We need, we need the same for the internet. Min Min asks a question again about education, and it's about um, whether we need more um, digital education within the context of non-computer science education. So, you know, is is should we foreground digital aspects of education across all disciplines, uh, or, or are there kind of ups and downs associated with doing that? Uh, no, I think there's a base level of, of understanding that everybody needs in this in this environment. Otherwise, there'll be a significant advantage. I mean, that's the short answer to that question. Um, you know, I mean, whether, whatever subject you're studying, I think there's a certain amount you need to know and understand if you're going to, if your life chances are not going to be affected negatively. Mm. So, so Julia asks a question, and I've certainly seen this among some of my friends who are going lo-fi with technology these days, partly in response to these kinds of concerns. And the question she asks, do, do you see a counter-reaction in society to the pervasiveness of digitization? Some of my friends have decided to downgrade their phones to avoid social media. More people are highlighting nature as a way to mitigate uh, impacts of technology in their life. Um, I guess the question is, you know, it, it, what's your take and what's your yeah. view on, 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 in a sense, that as a sort of set, set of sort of counter social movements? Uh, and, absolutely. And, 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 do you see absolutely. those among Gen Zers or is it, or is it the older tree huggers among us that? Um, no, no, it's Gen Z. So, so I would say one of the things I've learned most since finishing the book actually is I've come across a whole range of movements led by Gen Z um, entrepreneurs who recognize themselves the dangers of digital overload or have experienced digital overload and want to do something about it. So, in fact, next Saturday, I'm participating in a, what's called a shark tank, uh, you know, social entrepreneur competition in the States where it's the, it's the last in the series where entrepreneurs have come forward with solutions for digital overload. So I'll give you a classic example. There's a girl called Maddie Freeman, who's now 16, but she was 14 when she started her charity it's called no so november so instead of either growing your moustache or shaving off your moustache in november um you simply detox from social media for a month and she did that because she lost four friends in two years to suicide first first horrendous self-harm and then suicide uh, all girls who had got completely caught up in social media um, had developed low self-esteem body dysmorphia a whole range of issues and she lost four of her, of her close friends um, in that period of time and decided that she needed to do something about it. Um, that's a particularly egregious example. But yeah, I, I see many, many um, Gen Z entrepreneurs wanting to, to attack the problem themselves. And that gives me even more hope that something will actually happen. 
conscious of time, um, uh, I'll, I'll ask a question on behalf of a couple of colleagues of mine. We've we've discussed this Bob before, but this idea yeah. that that um, you know is distraction really a thing? Is too much screen time really that bad? <laughs> um you know on you know what, what what's the nuance of uh, of that argument and what what's your take on on these sorts of emerging and uh, arguments that seem to suggest at least in some context and some of the time actually maybe some of these concerns are a little overblown so so i'd love by the way to pick up with your colleague who participated mm. in that recent study that was published only a week or 10 days ago um, which does dispute the link between screen time and adolescent well-being issues. Um, and I think my conclusion is the following. As I say in the book, um, all screen time is not equal and all users are not equal. So simply um, investigating whether there's a link between spending nine hours a day on screens and adolescent well-being is to, is to me to miss the point because, uh, no offence to your colleague, but, but if you spend, you know, of that nine hours, I don't know, five hours um, educating yourself when you're not doing four other things at once. You're literally focused on some lectures and you spend the other four hours, let's say, watching a film for two hours in a focused way and not doing three other things. Right. That's one thing. Um, maybe gaming for an hour. Um, all of that's probably fine. Right. If um, you spend five hours of the nine hours gaming and four hours chilling through chilling and scrolling through social media. Right. That's probably not a good thing. And it's not a good, it's not maybe not a good thing for everybody or a bad thing for everybody, because which is the second point, all users are not equal. Some some kids are more vulnerable to bad experiences online than others are, just as they would be in the offline world. So I think we've got to recognize it's not about screen time, it's about what you're doing when you're on the screen. Um, and it's not about all users, it's about vulnerable users. And I think what we need to do is find a way of focusing our academic research um, not just on a link between screen time and adolescent well-being, but bad forms of screen time and particular kinds of adolescent well-being. And that's why I'd like to, mm. to do some more work. Maybe we could do some work together on that. Um, I feel certain that I have colleagues who'd be interested in that in that dialogue, Bob. So, so I'll, mm. I'll help facilitate that. Uh, perhaps a last question from Vinayak, which I think, again, is a really interesting question. And it's a question about what we, you know, I, I'll, I'll put myself in this category, but what, what we can do as older generations um, in terms of uh, getting up to speed with technology in order that we can understand this better. And I was very interested in your comments around um, the composition of Google's board and the position it put itself in relation to capacity to govern. And I think that there's a whiff of that in, in this question too. You know, what can we do as non-Gen Zers in order to uh, understand, empathise and regulate and behave more appropriately in relation to these technologies? Um, I mean, the, the obvious answer, um, which would be too self-serving, would be to say, read the book, because that's what it's for. Um, but I mean, I think I think you have to get down with the kids, basically. You have to get on some of these platforms and start using them yourselves. And you will be um, both fascinated and horrified by what you find if you're not on some of them. I mean, TikTok's genius, but it has some dark sides. Twitter. It honestly, I think is is has become a cesspit uh, of humanity. It is what are, what is on that platform now is so shocking. It is. I mean, I have no idea because I don't use Twitter particularly. Um, uh, and I, I what I've discovered is freely available. It's any any kid who goes on it is is really shocking. So I'm afraid you just got to get down with the kids and start using some of the platforms, and um, you will learn some good things and some bad things. And you know, the combination hopefully will put you in a better place to to um to partner with your kids in in delivering a better future for for your family i i think that's a fantastic um message getting down with the kids on on which to end i i will draw colleagues attention to the fact that um you can access the book and uh uh, and links to, to get your hands on a copy of Bob's book uh via his website you'll see that uh, being advertised in the chat so um well, well, thank you first to Bob for such a fascinating conversation. As I say, it's unusual for financiers to get involved in grand social theory. And I think um, Born Digital is an extraordinary project in lots of ways for its uh, intellectual scope um, and the issues that it encompasses. And I think it's a, a really fantastic read. Recommend it to, to everybody. So thanks, everybody. Really um, 
welcome your attendance today. I hope it's been really valuable. Um, thank you to Bob. Thank you to the team that organized it and, and hope you'll join us for another conversation around another fascinating book soon. So thank you, everybody. Good afternoon.